here in the house of the Lord one more time on today. We finished up last week our service, our, our series on the Lord's Prayer. I pray that that was beneficial to our lives and gave us something to equip us for what lies ahead. Now we're in, as we're still in the month of November and we're approaching the close of 2023 rapidly. There's a few other thoughts I'd like to leave with you and share with us. And today, I want us to focus on the fact that we are all called to do something by the Father. Now, when we think about being called to do something by the Father, we always think about being in the forefront. Everybody wants to be Peter, but nobody really wants to be Andrew. Everybody wants to be in the forefront, in the spotlight, but nobody thinks about what needs to happen on the back end. But what I want us to remember today is each and every one of us have a call on our life and a purpose to fulfill. Not all purposes are going to put us before people, but every purpose that we are to fulfill, there's somebody in the world that's awaiting our gift and our purpose. Now, if we know that we were designed and created to give God all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise, there should never be any hesitation within us to fulfill our purpose. But we're human beings, right? So the human side of us, the flesh in us, our nature will always cause us to run from the call that God has issued for our life. I'm not just telling you what people tell me. For a long time, it came to me that you should preach God's word. But I had 10,000 reasons why I couldn't, and I had a life resume that said I should not. But you have to get to the point where you're willing to accept the purpose that God has for your life. Now, it's not just as simple as, you know, life will tell us you can go stand in the mirror and you can just speak to yourself and affirm who you say you are and everything's going to work out, right? That's, we believe in the power of affirmation and the power of positive thinking and all these great things. But when it comes to your spiritual purpose in life, your flesh is not going to allow you to just wake up one day and say, I think I'm going to be everything God called me to be. That's not how it works. So what I want us to understand today is we have to use what we have. Because everything that we have, God has already equipped us. We're playing checkers. God is playing chess. We think we have to be molded and fortified into these things. But use what you got. We're going to make it live. Let's stand. Our scripture text for today is coming from the book of Exodus, chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. Very familiar passage of scripture. Okay? Use what you got. And God's word says, Moses answered, What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, Throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake, and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, the skin was left. It had become as white as snow. Now put it back in your cloak, he said. So Moses put his hand back in his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. Then the Lord said, if they do not believe you or pay any attention to that first sign, they may believe the second. Amen. Father God, we come to you as humbly as we know how, Father. Thanking you, Heavenly Father, for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy, Father. We're here today, Heavenly Father, for a word, Heavenly Father. It does not matter, Lord, what I have studied, Heavenly Father. This is your time and your season. So, Holy Spirit, speak to these 
your people, Heavenly Father. You know what we stand in need of, Heavenly Father. You know, Heavenly Father, better than we could ever say it, Heavenly Father. So we're trusting you right now in this moment, Heavenly Father, not just to meet needs, Father, but to exceed needs, Father. We thank you right now, Heavenly Father, for the word that is coming forth. We thank you right now, Heavenly Father, for the ears that are here to hear, Heavenly Father. We thank you right now, Lord, for the fertile soil that it will fall upon, Heavenly Father. Now bind us together, Lord, with a cord that cannot be broken, which is your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Use what you got. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about Moses. Now, in this particular passage of Scripture, Moses has, discovered, has uh, suffered from a terrible ego letdown. Okay? Now, what ego letdown has Moses suffered from? Okay? Now, at one point prior to this moment, Moses was enjoying the possibility of sitting on the throne of Egypt. Okay? In our scripture reading, he was looking after sheep in the desert, far, far away from people. There was a promise and an opportunity presented to Moses. Okay? Now, when Moses was a little boy, during his formative years, his mother would go to him all the time. Okay? And what she would basically say to Moses is, I want, don't you ever forget that you are a Hebrew. Now, our parents did the same thing for us. They send us away from home and off to school. Don't you forget who raised you. Don't you forget who you are. Don't you forget the lessons that I teach you. Because see, good parents pour into children when they're small and the ground is still fertile. It's no point in telling a 17-year-old to go out here and do what you say when from age 1 to 16, you didn't show them nothing and you didn't tell them nothing. See, Moses' mother understood this. So during the formative years, she would bring him to the side and she'd say to him, I know what you see when you go out here. I know what they tell you about these Egyptians. And I know the place of prominence they promised to you. But don't you forget that you are a Hebrew. Mm -hmm. See, these people that are walking around in oppression, these people that are walking around less fortunate, these people that are walking around in bondage, those are your people. Mm -hmm. So what you see before you and you think you're one of them, you're really one of us. Mm -hmm. Don't you forget what I tell you. Now that was a promise from his mother, because his mother knew who God had called him to be. But let me tell you what we do as people sometimes. Sometimes we want to rush the process. Okay? So Moses, here it is. Moses' mom is telling him, don't you forget that you're a Hebrew. Don't you forget. Don't you forget. Don't you forget. Now Moses is then, you know, you hear this at home and then you get over here in these settings and they're not treating you like the Hebrews are being treated. You ain't in bondage. You sitting over here in the lap of luxury. It's a conflict of interest. What mom tells you at home, remember, 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 but what you get out here in the street is contrary, contrary, contrary. You, your people are oppressed and we are in bondage, but I'm sitting here eating the best of the best and I'm rubbing elbows with this person and that person and these people are telling me everything that you want is at your disposal. Everything that you need is within your grasp, but your mama is saying, don't forget those people outside the window are your people. You see? Now, Moses then had a situation where one day he saw an Egyptian terrorizing a Hebrew. And what did Moses do? Well, in Moses' mind, he said, well, if God called me to be the deliverer of the Hebrews, I can't let this happen. So Moses killed the Egyptian. And when he killed the Egyptian, now there's one thing to have a call on your life. There's one thing to have a purpose for your life. But when we try to orchestrate the purpose within our own power, it's not going to go right. Moses decided that he was going to make himself the deliverer on that day, but Jesus had not yet called him to deliver the people. So Moses stepped 
ahead of himself. And when we step ahead of God's plan, when we try to do it in our own might, when we try to do it with our own intellect, it never works out right. So now, because of Moses' hot-headedness, now, because Moses couldn't wait, the promise was always there. But Moses tried to rush the promise, and now that he's rushed the promise, he's got innocent blood on his hands. Mm -hmm. And in this very moment, now he finds himself out in the wilderness, looking over sheep. He ain't in the palace no more. He don't got on the finest of robes anymore. He ain't eating at Pharaoh's table. He's out in the wilderness. Because that's what happens to us when we step outside of God's plan. Don't allow your ego to cause you to believe that God has forgotten your purpose. Don't allow your intellect to cause you to believe that you can train yourself for what God has called you to do. Because see, I'm pretty sure in Moses' mind, he felt like, well, if I'm going to be the deliverer of my people, I got to get myself ready and I can't take this and I can't take that. That wasn't how God had the plan worked out. Our mind and our intellect can only see this much of the picture. But God sees the entire portrait. He knows the ins and outs. He knows the turns and nooks and crannies, and he knows that which is far ahead of you. So he will make a way out of no way. He's always going to take the foolish to confound the wise. He ain't going to do it the way that you think it needs to be done. But by the time he does it, we'll realize that all things come together for the good of those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Use what you got. The Lord didn't bless Moses to free the Hebrews while he was in a position of prominence. That's not when he did it. He let him go out in the wilderness. He let him go through some things. He let him suffer a little bit because in your suffering, it produces your humility. Amen. Because see, when you suffer for it, mm -hmm. when you go through something for it, yes. you appreciate it. Amen. When you are suffering, you are truly seeking. Yes. But when we're on the mountaintop, we kind of feel like we can do it by ourselves. Yeah. When we're on the mountaintop, we'll say, well, you know, my studying helped me get here. When we're on the mountaintop, we'll say, my education helped me get here. When we're on the mountaintop, we'll say, my money helped me get here. But when we're in the valley, yeah. we're looking for any possible way out. You can't look no lower because there ain't no lower. You got no choice but to look up. And that's what Moses had to realize. Okay? God never forgot. God just had to take him through the process mm -hmm. to bring him to his purpose. Even the 40 years that they wandered in the desert were preparation. Because do you realize that the desert that they wandered through through those 40 years would later be the place that he would lead the Hebrew people through. He went through it suffering, but he returned back to it leading. That's the kind of God we serve because all things work together for the good. If he would have blessed Moses in the palace, Moses wouldn't know nothing about the wilderness experience. That's right. How can Moses relate to the people? How could Moses lead? And I'm going to tell you something about when it comes down to leading people, okay? People are led when they feel a connection to you and that which you present unto them. Don't believe me? Why can we not relate to some millionaires and millionaires' problems? Because we ain't never experienced anything like that. When somebody tells you they broke and they got $75,000 in the bank, they can't talk to me because I don't understand that. That ain't in my checking account on the best days that I've ever experienced. But when there's somebody that you can identify with and you can relate to, it's easier for you to accept that which they come to teach you. So if this is true, we can use what we have. Because that which we have is going to serve a purpose. Don't believe me. When Obama was elected president, I never had a vested interest in politics before that night when Yes We Can and yes, he did. But suddenly on that night, I felt like I could push a little harder. 
Suddenly on that night, I felt like I could go on a little further. Suddenly on that night, I felt like a door was open that wasn't open before because Obama stood before me and I could identify and I could relate. Never before that moment had there ever been anyone in a position of power that I felt so closely connected to. But it was because there was a relation. Now, what does that do for us in this? First point, I want you to always remember that God uses people to do his work. Okay? People. Everyday, ordinary people. God uses people to do his work. Now, if God wanted the, pe the people, the Hebrews, free, he could have simply said, free. And they'd all be free, right? He could have opened up heaven and sent down legions of angels and everyone could have been whisked and carried away. But that's not what God desired to do. He didn't want to do it that way. He wanted to use ordinary, everyday people. Okay? Now, when God chooses people, he chooses some people with PhDs. He chooses some people with advanced degrees. But how many of you know he also chooses people with diplomas and GEDs? Aren't you glad yeah. that he chooses everyday people? Yeah. Now, he could have chosen model citizens, people that never got into trouble, people that never knew a bad side of the law. He chooses some of them. But how many of you understand that God also chooses some people that live on the other side of the tracks? How many of you understand that God chooses some people that have been through the judicial system? How many of you understand that God chooses some people that knows the lingo of the streets? How many of you understand that God chooses people that are still out there in the streets? He chooses everyday, ordinary people. Yes. Now, aren't you glad that we serve a God that chooses ordinary people to do extraordinary things? Mm -hmm. Anybody could have delivered the Hebrews. Anybody could have sat in the palace. There were some that society would say were destined for. But God says, I'm going to look beyond them and give me this one over here. He ain't even worthy to be there. He don't even want to be there. But I'm going to use him, and I'm going to use exactly what he has. So the next time the in crowd tells you that you can't sit with him, don't worry about it. The next time the church mothers tell you that you don't have a right to sit on the front row, don't worry about it. The next time your brunch and mimosa friends don't send you the invitation, don't get upset. The next time your children get angry with you and you think that you're the worst parent ever, don't you worry about it. The next time they tell you you don't have the look for the part, don't get bent out of shape. The next time they tell you the only way you can be successful is if you do it this way and this way and this way, I want you to stand flat-footed and I want you to remember he chose you exactly as you are. And you can use what you got because exactly what you have is exactly what's needed for the situation. There's a little story that some people like to tell to make this live and make this make sense. So they said that after Jesus was raised from the dead and he returned to heaven, when he returned to heaven, everybody rushes to Jesus because they want to find out what was going on and what happened. And when they all rushed around Jesus, what Jesus did is he started to explain to them that, you know, he came down and he died. And he explained to them that he conquered death. He explained to them that, you know, the plan of salvation. And then he said, now, Salvation is available for everybody. Mm -hmm. I open the door and anybody, now now the whosoever will, is truly in effect because of what I've done. Everybody's in awe. Everybody's amazed. Now, how many of you understand that when you are in situations where everybody comes together and everybody's happy and everybody's on one accord, there's always that one friend. Mm -hmm. There's always one person present. There was one angel that said, well, Jesus, but how, how's everybody going to know what you've done? You know, like you did this, but how are they going to know? That, that, you told us, but did you tell everybody down there? 
Jesus smiled and said, don't worry about it. I told my friends, and my friends are going to spread the message around the world. My friends are going to tell their friends, and their friends are going to tell their friends, and their friends are going to tell their friends, and before you know it, everybody down there in the world is going to know what I've done. That same doubting angel said, but Jesus, what if, what if they're too busy? What if they forget? What, what if they, you know, they get to the point where they could care less, and this is not what they want to do? Jesus looked at the ground, and Jesus looked back at him, and he said, I'm not going to worry about it. And the reason that I'm not going to worry about it is because those are my friends. And they won't disappoint me. And besides, I don't have any other plans to accomplish. So if we are truly friends of Jesus, if we are truly disciples of Christ, if we truly want to walk in our purpose, we can use what we have to spread his message to the world. Because he designed us uniquely so that each and every one of us has a different story. Each and every one of us has a different testimony. Each and every one of us has a different circumstance. Each and every one of us has a different situation. And he equipped us with these situations so that we can spread his message to all those that identify with our situation. He had no other plan. So use what you have. Now, when we think of stewardship, we think about tithing and giving our money. You know, who are the best stewards? The ones that give, give, give. But understand that stewardship is humankind's acceptance of the responsibility to do with your life what God has planned for you. True stewardship is deeper than your money. True stewardship is when we decide that we are going to allow God to use us to accomplish the plan that he has destined for us. That's when we enter true stewardship, okay? But true stewardship also involves material possessions. It's not just it's that, that part is major, but material possessions come into play as well because there are some people that have accepted their purpose for Christ's plan full-time. They don't work. They labor for Christ, okay? And then that money that we give allows them to advance the kingdom and do what needs to be done. But when we give the money, how do we give? We should freely give, correct? <laughs> don't begrudgingly give. Don't suck your teeth and give. Don't roll your eyes and say, well, I can do this and this and this. But freely give. Because that is your stewardship to help advance the kingdom. Now, understand the parallel of this. The money that you give helps advance God's kingdom on earth because heaven does not need your money. But the money that you give allows us to spread the gospel here in all four corners and in the highways and in the byways to everyone that will listen. But the discipline that you use to give builds your faith. And that's what's honored in heaven. It's the discipline of the act, not the dollar amount that you give. Don't think you can buy your way in. Don't think because you give 17% and some of us struggle to give 3% that you're getting ahead of us. Because if I give my 3% from a place of sacrifice and you give your 17% from a place of excess, who is being honored more? So always be a good steward and realize that you're going to give your time, you're going to give your talent, and you're going to give your treasure. We're going to put it all together. Don't just give your money, give your time as well. Don't just give your time, but use your talent as well. What does that mean for us? If you can't come and set the church up on Sunday, maybe you can help take the church down on Sunday after service. If you can't do neither, Maybe you can invite someone to join us online. If you can't do that, maybe you can send an encouraging text and pray for the ones that are doing it and encourage others to come. There is always something that you can do, but never think that your gift is so small because the world is waiting on your gift and God uses ordinary, everyday individuals to get this stuff done. 
we'll never, I'll never have the platform of Oprah, but that which God has entrusted me with, I'll be a good shepherd over that. I'll honor it the same way she honors what she has. I'll be devoted to it the same way that she is because I'm going to use what he gave me to do that which he has called me to do. I'm not going to compare myself to T.D. Jakes. I'm not going to compare myself to Keon Henderson. I'm not going to compare myself to Martin Luther King. I'm going to stay in my lane and I'm going to do what he called me to do because he uses ordinary, ordinary, everyday people. Next point, God supplies answers for all our excuses. If you have an excuse, God already has an answer. Everything that your mind can tell you why you can't, God has a reason why you can't. See, we're just like Moses. We hold back from accepting responsibility. Okay? You see, Moses is wondering, and Moses is doing all these things, and Moses is giving excuses. Let's look at the excuses. When the call first came, Moses had an identity crisis. His mom had told him his whole life what he was destined to do, okay? He had had the opportunity to watch the plan unfold, but when the rubber hits the road, Moses has an excuse. He said, what am, who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out? Who am I? Me? Why can I do it? How are you going to use me? I'm divorced. How are you going to use me? I've had a DUI. How are you going to use me? People remember me from high school. How are you going to use me? Do you not know what they say about me on social media? How are you going to use me? Nobody really comes to the church. How are you going to use me? I'm a terrible father. How are you going to use me? I've messed up so many times. What did God say? God did not tell him who he was, but rather promised him to be with him and to guide him. God was like, I don't even got time to tell you who you are. So in return, what I'm going to do, I'm going to just promise you that I'll be with you and I'll guide you. Don't worry about it, Moses. Who are you? I sent you. And if I sent you, I'll be with you. See, God can't give us the whole plan because when he gives us the whole plan, our ego gets in the way. And now we start to think, oh, that's how he's going to do it? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to walk up to Pharaoh and I'm going to have all these people with me and I'm going to have a crowd and I'm going to make a scene and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. Because that's our ego talking and that's not God's will talking. So what God did was God just simply said, don't worry about how to do it. Just know I'm going to be with you and it's going to be done. We got to trust him even when we can't trace him. That's why it's called faith. Because we don't know how he's going to do it. We just know that he can. Yes. We don't know when he's going to do it. We just know that he can. And we have to have enough faith that even if he doesn't do it when we think we need it, when he does it, it's always going to be on time. Mm -hmm. Now, just like Moses, we never discover our full truth about ourselves until we commit our abilities to the Lord. We never know all that we are capable of until we surrender. All to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. I'll forever love and trust him in his presence daily live. Not all to Jesus, I give this portion over here. Not all to Jesus, I give the good stuff. Not all to Jesus, I give when convenient. But all to Jesus, I freely give. I can't do it by myself, Lord. So however you choose to do it. I don't have the answer, Lord, but I'm going to trust you to give the answer. I know what my eyes see before me, but I'm going to trust that you are with me. That's why we say he makes ways out of nowhere. Because our mind can't fathom the way out. But God already has the exit plan in place. We've just got to trust him. Whatever the rebuttal is that you have, God has an answer for that rebuttal. Okay? Now, we may desire to just simply be a school teacher and teach the fourth grade. But God's plan for your life may be to be the district superintendent. You think in this small but God's plan is this big. But you say, well, I'm not apt to teach the district, but didn't he allow you to teach Sunday school? Didn't he allow you to raise your nieces and nephews? Didn't 
Then he allow you to raise your children. But I don't have the education to step into that realm. But God is like, I got all power in my hand. And if I call you to it, I'll see you through it. You may just want to manage the shift at your job. 3 to 11, you just want to be the one to make the calls and tell the people what to do and be the one to keep everything going. But God had a plan for you to be the CEO of your company. But I didn't go to business school, but I'm not on the Forbes 400 list, but I've never done this and I've never been recognized for this. But God says, I got all power in my hand. Because see, if you relied on your education, your education is going to tell you when the ebbs and flows go this way, this is what you're going need to do. But if you don't got that education and all you got is faith in me, you're going to fall flat on your face and you're going to say, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No other help I know. If thou withdraw thyself from me, where other shall I go? And he makes a way out of no way because you're not relying on your intellect. You're relying on his power. You may desire simply to have a good relationship with your children. You just want home to be happy. You just want everything to go nice in your house. You just want to be able to wake up and not have an attitude. But God desires to make you a mentor and a patriarch to the children of the community. God ain't go to school for counseling. God, they ain't going to listen to me because they see how I get along with my kids. God, ain't nobody coming to me for advice. But God says, but didn't I call you to it? <clears throat> The same thing happening in your house is happening in the community. So I already prepared you for the situation. Step into it. He'll make a way out of no way. You have an excuse, but God has a purpose. And if God has a purpose, we must trust the process. Okay? So when we give God our ability, when we rely fully on him, we find our true potential. And you know what we, like, we start to do? We start to say, not by might and not by power, but by your spirit. We start to say, I don't know how it's going to work out, but I trust that God is going to work it out. We start to say, I'm not going to worry about what's before me because I know who goes to war for me. Yeah. There's no need to worry. There's no need to fret. There's no need to fear because he's going to make a way out of no way. Now, the excuses that we have, I want you to understand this about excuses. Excuses are rarely the real reason that hold us back from accepting what God has for our life. The problem is with our stewardship. We don't want to take the accountability. We don't want to wear that hat and that burden. Oh, you want me to free the people? It's going to be some headaches that come along with that. It's going to be some heartache that comes along with that. It's going to be some ridicule that comes along with that. I, I really don't want to put my hands in that. But true stewardship is when you're ready to take full accountability. Moses couldn't find it in the palace. He had to find it out in the desert. He couldn't find it before people where the people could... The burning bush wasn't in the heart of the city. So everybody said, wow, there's a burning bush in it. Talking to Moses, I guess God sent him. Uh-uh. It was done in the wilderness, far away, when Moses was probably doubting what God had said. When Moses was probably saying, you know, my mom said what I was going to do, but she might have, you know, mom might have been wrong. It was in those moments that the plan was revealed to him because he had to be far away where he could take full accountability. We must use what we got. Okay? Now, what did Moses have? Moses had a rod, and that rod became a symbol. David had a sling, and that sling killed Goliath. There was a little boy that had two fish and five loaves of bread, and it fed the multitude. What kind of math do you know where two fish and five loaves could feed thousands? You got to use what you got. And notice, the loaves and the fish weren't in the hands of a master chef. Notice, the loaves and the fish didn't come from a mother of 35 kids that knew how to make a meal stretch. The loaves and the fish came from a child. A child. Childlike faith. Mm -hmm. 
he gave it to Andrew and said, this is all I got. Maybe this can help you feed all those people over there. So many people present, you couldn't even find your family in the crowd if you tried. And here's a little boy that said, they hungry? What about this? Because it's not about the quantity of the gift. It's about the hands that hold the gift. It's a snack when your mama gives it to you. But in the hands of the master, it's a feast for the multitude. Everybody ate and there was food left over. Yeah. It's a slingshot when we hold it in our hands. But when we're called by the master, it's a giant slayer. Yeah. It was a rod when Moses held it in his hand. But it was proof to the people when the master sent him with it. Now, what motivated Moses to a life of commitment? Two things. Moses saw the need, and he finally realized that God would provide the resources. What is the need in your life today? Everybody has one. We don't have to talk about it. We don't have to say it out loud, but we can rest assured that everyone sitting in here today has a need in their life. You want to have victory over the need? Accept the fact that God has equipped you with the resources to defeat the need and deficit in your life. When you go home today, I want you to think about the situations that you're facing. I want you to think about your health. I want you to think about your children that ain't acting right. I want you to think about the job that's getting on your nerves. I want you to think about the relationships that are falling apart. I want you to think about the money that ain't in the bank that you need to be there. And I want you to stand firm and know that God has the resources. Yes. He didn't just do it for Moses. He did it for Moses. So when we have doubt, we can say, well, Lord, you did it for Moses. And he was full of doubt. I know you'll do it for me. He didn't just slay the giant for Goliath. For he didn't just slay, use David to slay Goliath. He did that for us. So the giant in your life, you can say, if he did it with the slingshot for David, he'll do the same for me. He didn't just feed the multitude to prove to this little boy that he did it. He could do it. He did it so that when we are in a season of lack, we can understand that there is nothing too hard for God. Use what you got. Don't let anybody tell you that your gift is insignificant. If all you can do is sweep the floors, sweep the floor. Amen. If all you can do is give a hug, give a hug. If all you can do is show up, show up. Because your presence is necessary, your gift is necessary, and there is someone waiting for your gift. Amen. Use what you got. Amen. Let us stand. <clears throat>